thoughts expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. But they should. But they should be the views of everybody. James over here with you, Word from the Lord. Hope you are with us, uh, ready to study the Bible with us. We want you to uh, feel free to call in when we put our phone numbers up, and we want you to feel free to visit us or uh, ask us a Bible question. Had a good call. Caleb had a good call come in. The lady down in Greensboro is watching. Hope she continues to watch, and uh, hope there's more individuals like that lady who was looking for the truth, got tired of all the, I want to say garbage that goes on in all the denominations, and are looking for the true uh, church, the uh, perfect will of God, and so we hope that, that uh, we'll be able to help her, and uh, we hope that if you are looking for the truth, that you'll come and visit with us, and uh, let us uh, get to know you, a word from the Lord at gmail.com, say you can reach me, 276-340-2653 is uh, uh, how you can reach me by phone, and uh, I'm going to say, friends, that tonight that uh, we are going to be discussing something that I think a lot of people have never thought of, and that is that you may be, you may be phoning in your religion. Now, what do I mean by phoning it in? I'm talking about letting someone else do it for you. Would you let someone go to heaven for you? Think about that. If someone said, you know what, I'll go to heaven for you, we'll change places, or I'll go to heaven for you, and, and you won't have to. Would you do that? If you're watching this program, you're interested in the Bible, you're interested in, in knowing what the will of God is, you probably would not want to make that deal. Let someone else go to heaven for you. But you know, there's a lot of individuals that practice religion by proxy. They practice religion by proxy. Now, here's what I mean by proxy. Proxy is where you authorize a, a person to act on your behalf. Proxy means that a person is authorized to act on behalf of another, maybe they have an agent, or maybe they are a substitute. Uh, I know sometimes uh, when you um, are, are dealing with big corporations and they're dealing with they're voting on uh, uh, board of directors or things like that. Sometimes they hold a big convention and everybody can't come, so you can mail in a, a proxy card. You can tell say who it is that you're authorizing to vote for you or to make. Uh, 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 judgments or decisions for you, and that is that becomes your proxy. Now, proxy also is the authority to act for another, or the written authorization to act in place of another. Now, you may think, well, I don't know that anybody in the religious world would actually do anything by proxy. I mean, I know there's a lot of individuals that would say, you know, you don't do anything for your in uh, for your salvation. They would teach do nothing salvation, but com coming coming. Uh, uh, from the standpoint of letting someone else do something for you? I mean, that's even, that's even lazier than do-nothing salvation, if you ask me, right? Well, but did you, did you know that our friends in the Latter-day Saints Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, do you know they, they actually believe in proxy religion? They, they believe in proxy religion. That, that is, they let someone do something else for them. Now, you may say, that's, that's kind of crazy. Well, let me just show you what I'm talking about. The folks in the, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they teach baptism for the dead. That is, they teach that someone, someone can be baptized on behalf of or for someone else. Now, look at this. This is a quote from Doctrines and Covenants. Now, that's their book. Now, probably most of you are all familiar with the Book of Mormon. That's the kind of the book they give away. But the Doctrines and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price these are also books that they use as their, as their authority. But in Doctrines and Covenants, Doctrines and Covenants, chapter 128, verses 5 through 18, I want you to read with me, read, read what they say about baptism for the dead. Verse 5, <clears throat> now this is the Latter-day Saints uh, book, the Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 128, verse 5. You may think this order of things to be very particular, but let me tell you that it is only to answer the will of God by conforming to the ordinance and preparation that the Lord ordained and prepared before the foundation of the world for the salvation of the dead who die without a knowledge of the gospel. All right, you let that sink in. 
They're saying God prepared a way for the salvation of the dead who died without a knowledge of the gospel. Well, what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about that? They say, well, verse 15, skip down to verse 15. It says, and now, my dearly beloved brethren and sisters, let me assure you that these principles, I'm going to step off here so you can read it. These principles in relation to the dead and the living that cannot be lightly passed over as pertaining to our salvation. For their salvation is necessary and essential to our salvation. As Paul says concerning the fathers, that they without us cannot be made perfect, neither can we without our dead be made perfect. So we need, we need the dead people. We need to be saved for them. We need to do something for them. And uh, so that's what that's why they have this teaching. Now go on. Verse 16 says, And now, in relation to the baptism for the dead, I will give you another quotation of Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Verse uh, 17. And again, in connection with this quotation, I will give you a quotation from one of the prophets who had his eye fixed on the restoration of the priesthood, the glories to be revealed in the last days, and in an especial manner, this most glorious of all subjects belonging to the everlasting gospel, namely the baptism for the dead. For Malachi says, last chapter, verses 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, uh, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right. Then verse 18, it says, I might have rendered a plainer translation to this, but it is sufficiently plain to suit my purpose as it stands. It is sufficient to know in this case that the earth will be smitten with a curse unless... There is a wielding, of, uh, a wielding link of some kind or other between the fathers and the children upon some, upon some subject or other. And behold, what is the subject? It is the baptism for the dead. So the Latter-day Saints are saying that the reason why they are baptized for someone who's dead is because there needs to be a link between the dead and the living, the fathers and the children. So they're doing all they can to, to uh, convince you and convince me that we need to be baptized, or they should, they're okay baptizing for the dead, on behalf of the dead. Someone died, you know, great-great-grandma Gussie, and she died, and, uh, you know, she, what, she, didn't, she never heard the gospel, so... You know, I need to be baptized for her. I guess you can be baptized two or three times. Just, you know, name them. Just, I guess, say their name as you go under. I, I don't know how that works. But, uh, you know, this is for this is for Ma. This is for Paul. I, I don't know how that works. But I, I, I don't know. But they're being baptized by proxy. These people that are dead, the Latter-day Saints are saying, yeah, yeah, let's, let, let's baptize them. Let's baptize them by proxy because they never heard the gospel. Now, friends, think about this. Uh, uh, without them cannot be made perfect, they go on to say. Neither can they without us be made perfect. Neither can they nor we be made perfect without those who have died in the gospel. For it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times, which dispensation is now being ushered in, that a whole and complete and perfect union and wielding together of dispensations, keys, and powers and glories should take place and reveal in the day of Adam even to the present. So you can't bring in the fullness of time unless we're all linked together and we're all going to be linked together by the baptism of the dead because there's some people out here who didn't, who didn't know the gospel and so if, if we're not baptized for them, then I guess the chain's broken. I don't know. Is that like one of those... Uh, you know, chain letters you get in the mail. If you don't, if you don't pass it on, you know you're gonna have ten years of bad luck, and uh, you know and your cat's gonna die or something. I, I don't know, but they've got to connect everybody together. So they're gonna be baptizing for the dead. He goes on to say, 
they're going to say, uh, uh, and this, and not only this, but those things which never have been revealed from the foundation of the world, but have been kept, kept hid from the wise and prudent, shall be revealed unto babes and sucklings in this, the dispensation of the fullness of time. So, if, if, if you're not baptized for the dead, there's not going to be, there's not going to be a connection between all these uh, folks who died prior to and all these folks living today. So we need to connect the dots and the way we're going to connect the dot is by uh, baptism for the dead. Now, friends, listen, baptism by proxy, baptism for the dead, baptizing, being baptized, being immersed on behalf of someone else, that's foreign to the Bible. There, there, there is no, no such thing as being baptized for the dead, even though they gave some scripture. Let me tell you, when Paul said, uh, let me just say this. When Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, when he was talking about being baptized for the dead, he wasn't talking about being baptized for the individuals who are dead. He's talking about being baptized in preparation for death. All right? Um, what's, what's the purpose of being baptized if the dead, if the dead folks rise not, if they're if the people in the realm of death rise not, then what's the purpose of being baptized? So uh, that's, that's what he's saying there. He's saying being baptized to prepare for death. Well, what's the purpose of being baptized to prepare for death if the death, if you're not going to be raised from the dead? And 1 Corinthians 15 is talking all about being raised from the dead. If Jesus Christ be not raised, we of all men are... are uh, 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 well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting it here. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, we are most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if Christ, uh, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we of all men are most miserable. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then we don't have any hope. So he's not talking about being baptized on behalf of someone who's dead. He's talking about being baptized for the, uh, for the event that we're all going to die, being prepared for death. All right? Now, if you look at the Bible, friends, the Bible says nothing about being baptized by proxy. As a matter of fact, when you talk about being baptized, when you, when you read the Bible and you say the subject of baptism, 1 Corinthians 15, 29 is the only verse that, that uh, people twist to talk about being baptized for someone who's already dead. Everywhere else, baptism is always for the living. Now, why is it in that one spot we're supposed to believe that we're baptized for someone who's been dead for 100 years when everywhere else the Bible talks about being baptized, it's for a different reason and it's for that person who's living today. See, if we're going to rightly divide the word of truth, which is what we're supposed to do, We'll understand that baptism is not for someone who has been dead, but it's for someone who's living and preparing for the day when we'll die so that we can raise again. Now notice this. When you read Mark 16, Mark 16, 16, and I'm going to put this up here for us, Mark 16, 16, you'll never get the idea, you'll never get the impression that it is for someone else, that it is, that it is something that's done by proxy. Notice this. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that's he, not he that believeth and is baptized for someone else will save him and someone else. It's a personal thing. It's for that individual. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. So the person who's going to be saved is the person who himself believes and is baptized, and the person who's going to be condemned is the person who doesn't believe at all. See how it is? You, you don't get to uh, be saved, or you, you don't get to be saved by, by proxy. You don't, you don't have any reason to be baptized for someone else. That's, that's foreign to the Scriptures. Notice this. In Acts 2 and verse 38, Acts 2 and verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent 
and be baptized, every one of you. Now, think about this. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How, how, how crazy does it sound to say, well, uh, uh, you can be baptized for someone else. Well, you know what? If, if 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost were, uh, were baptized, 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost were baptized according to what Peter said. But if baptism by proxy were true, you know what? I, if I'd have been there, I'd say, you know what? Uh, you go ahead and stand in line and be baptized for me. I'm going to go on back home. You know? I mean, why did 3,000 people have to be baptized? Why not just baptize one person 3,000 times? <laughs> you know, we're all good. No, friends. This is because the gospel, the gospel when it's preached is for the individual to respond for himself. It's not by proxy. Baptism from the dead, baptism for the dead, contradicts the Bible. And you know what? It actually contradicts Mormon doctrine. It actually contradict, they actually contradict themselves when they start talking about baptism uh, for the dead. Notice this. Now, we already read Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 128, verses 5 and 15 through 18. But now, let's look at the Book of Mormon. You know, the Book of Mormon, that maybe you, want, you might have one of those. You know, one of those that they give away or whatever. But notice this. In, in, the, in, the, in the Book of Mormon, in Moroni, in the Book of Moroni, chapter 8 and verse 22, Chapter 8 and verse 22, here's what it says. It says, For behold, that all little children are alive in Christ, and also all they that are without the law. Now watch this. For the power of redemption cometh on all them that have no law. The power of redemption comes on all them that have no law. Wherefore, he that is not condemned, or he that is under no condemnation, cannot repent, and unto such baptism availeth nothing. But it is mockery before God, denying the mercies of Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit, and putting trust in dead works. Now they're saying that baptism is a dead work, and that there's no need to be baptized Talk about little children especially. But let me ask you this. Well, if a little child, if a little child is, dies, don't they need to be baptized to keep that link? Don't they need to be baptized, you know, because they're dead? We've got, we got some baptism of the dead going on here, but now they're saying, no, there's no need to baptize. No, there's no need in the baptize, baptizing. Baptism availeth much, uh, uh, availeth nothing. You see how it is? So on one side, we say, well, we need to be baptized for the dead, but on this case, we don't need to be baptized. Baptism is essential if, if you're be being baptized for someone who's already dead. But in this case, there's no need to be baptized. Well, which is it? Is baptism essential or is it not essential? Is baptism for the dead essential or is it not essential? Do we have to baptize for the dead to keep that link, to bring in the fullness of time and the dispensation and all the knowledge and so forth? Or do we not? See what a tangled web you weave when you try to rest the scriptures or in this case you add another gospel? Now friends, I think you're seeing, and I think, I think it's pretty easy to see, how, how crazy it is to talk about being, being baptized by proxy. You know, I'm going to be baptized for someone that's been dead. Would you do that? So, man, I, I, think that's, I think that's crazy stuff, you know. When I think about that kind of, that kind of doctrine, I think, man, somebody's been, uh, you know, somebody's been, you know, using the magic markers and leaving the cap off or something. They've been sniffing something too much. they kind of going loopy. Crazy. That's a crazy thing. Baptism by proxy? Now, how many out there agree with me on that? Man, that that's, a, that's a crazy doctrine. 
that proxy uh, a religion. That's crazy. Being baptized for someone else, man, you've got to be out of your mind, baptism by proxy. That proxy religion, the, the, the Latter-day Saints, boy, they just, they've kind of gone off the deep end on this uh, proxy stuff, you know, doing stuff for someone else, getting someone else to do something for you. That's, that, that's, that's crazy stuff. That's crazy stuff. Well, I'll agree with you. But you know what, friends? Probably most of you out there who are agreeing with me that this is what the Latter-day Saints doctrine of baptism by proxy is like. You're out there, and you know what? I'm going to say you believe in some kind of proxy religion too. <gasps> you think about this? Listen. Listen. If baptism by proxy is crazy, what about sin by proxy? What about sin by proxy? If you think it's outrageous to say, well, someone's going to be baptized for the dead on behalf of someone else, if that's crazy, well, well what about sin by proxy? Now, what do you mean sin by proxy? Well, this is exactly what I mean. Listen, here's, here's the primitive Baptist, and here's what the primitive Baptist say about, about sin, born in sin. Listen. And it also brings about eternal death, that is, an everlasting separation uh, from the Almighty. The plan. Now, Adam uh, disobeyed God. I want to make that very clear. His disobedience brought sin into the world. Now, when he disobeyed God, the whole human family were in his loins by way of representation because all human I, beings I can't, I can't hear it. are offsprings of Adam. Adam oh, is the father of all humans, and Eve is the mother of all humans. Therefore, as the Bible says here, as the Apostle Paul lays out, as by the uh, <coughs> one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Now, when were they made sinners? When Adam disobeyed. Our nature was in Adam. We uh, indeed fell into transgression all together at the same time. All right. All cursed in Adam. Everybody gets Adam sin, man. When Adam sinned, he, he, he ruined it for everybody. Well, now, friend, isn't that, isn't that sin by proxy? I mean, think about it. Here's a little child born into the world. Hadn't done, I mean, hadn't done anything, and all of a sudden, yep, you're a sinner. Well, how did I sin? Well, you got it from Adam. He, he sinned for you. Yeah, he sinned for you. Well, Wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, yeah, sin by proxy. Sin by proxy. I mean, what is born in sin if it's not sin by proxy? you letting someone else did something for you on your behalf, if you will. Adam sinned and ruined everybody. It ruined everything. Now, if you go around saying a child's born in sin, and there's a lot of you out there that believe it, you think, well, man, those, those, those Mormons, they're crazy for believing in that baptism by proxy. Well, you believe in born in sin by proxy. You believe in sinning by proxy. Now listen, the Bible says the Bible says that that uh, there that sin Hebrews 11 and verse 25 talking about Moses says uh, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of, the, of God rather than enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. Now listen, friends. If, I, if I'm going to be guilty of sin, if sin's going to be laid to my account, the Bible says there's some pleasure in sin. Hey, I'm not passing on that. I'm not passing on that. If I'm going to sin, I'm going to get to the pleasure of myself. I don't want Adam to get all the pleasure of sinning, all right? Now I'm being silly. But you see what I'm saying, friends? You can't sin by proxy, but yet you teach it. You believe it. You say you're born in sin. Born in sin, and therefore Adam, Adam sinned for us. Nothing you can do, you're a sinner. When you're born, you're a sinner. Come, come, uh, come from the wound line. 
Somebody's going to call in and say that. Now, friends, if, if you say you're born a sin, and you're saying someone else sinned for him. Now, what's the difference in that and being, and being uh, uh, like the Mormons and saying, well, I'm going to be baptized for the dead? Maybe if you're born in sin, I tell you what, maybe you can go find a Mormon and be baptized for you. All you, all you folks out there that don't want to be baptized, you know, we all want to get rid of baptism, you know, tear it out of the book or whatever, hydrophobic. Want to make all kinds of excuses for being baptized. Well, you know the Bible says that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And you're, seeing, you're saying there uh, that you're born in sin. Well, go find one of your Mormon friends to be baptized for you. Maybe that's, why the, maybe that's why Mormons and Baptists are starting to get along. Maybe they're realizing, hey, Baptists don't want to get wet, and the Mormons say, I'll get wet for anybody. Well, born in sin is, is sin by proxy. So, well, James, that's, that's, that's silly. Well, it's your doctrine, not mine. It's your doctrine, not mine. That, that's not in the Bible. Sin by proxy is not in the Bible. Every man, every man sins when he is drawn away after his own lust and enticed. Look at this. In James chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says, Let no man say when he is, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Every man. Then when... Lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Who's this? Every man. Every man. Not sin by proxy. All right? Not sin by proxy. Now, friends, think about that. Is that really, is that really what you teach? Is that really what you believe? All right? You say, well, James, I, I don't believe in sin by proxy. Well, then why do you teach it? What about faith by proxy? What about faith by proxy? How many... Now, friends, I want you to listen carefully. How many of you listening to me? How many of you listening to me believe what you believe because that's what your mom and your daddy were? That's what your parents were. That's what your grandparents were. I've been this all my life. So it's really not your faith, it's someone else's faith. You're a member of the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, because that's that's where your mommy and daddy were. Is that is that really what you want us to believe? Is that really what we're what we're supposed to believe, friends? You you believe in faith by proxy. You believe in faith by proxy. Look at John 3, John 8 and verse 39. John 8 and verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth. Uh, which I uh, which I've heard of God, this did not Abraham. They wanted to kill Jesus for telling the truth. They said, well, Abraham was our father. Jesus quickly set them straight. You know what? You don't get to claim your ancestry as a means of being righteous with God. He said, you want to kill me because I'm telling you the truth. Abraham would have done that. He said, you do the works, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we have... Uh, we be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. 
Listen to them. Listen to them. We are claiming to be children of God. We're claiming to be children of Abraham because, hey, we can trace our bloodline. We can, chase, we can trace our, our genealogy. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. If God were your father, you would love me. Friends, you don't get to claim that you are righteous with God because your mom and your daddy were, or because you think your mom and your daddy were. Listen, if, if anyone, if anyone had a claim to faith by proxy, it would be the Jews. Abraham, Abraham is the father of the faithful. He's the father of the faithful. Galatians 3 and verse 7, look at this. Paul says, Know ye therefore this, uh, know ye therefore that they which uh, are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. If anybody would be able to claim, hey, we're righteous in God's sight because we have a faithful father, Abraham, it would be the Jews. Well, friends, you don't get to claim faith by proxy. You don't get to claim, well, I'm righteous because someone in my ancestry was righteous. Now, you would think, you would think that y'all would make a big argument about that because you, you want to say Adam sinned. Adam sinned uh, for you. you. You got sin by proxy. Surely you can get faith by proxy. But it's not that way, friends. It just does not work that way. The Bible is clear that every man sins for himself and has to give an answer for himself. In Luke 3 and verse 8, Luke 3 and verse 8. Jesus said, Bring forth therefore, I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, uh, this is John the baptizer. He says, Bring therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves. Notice this. Don't be claiming faith by proxy. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You don't get to claim someone else's faith, someone else's faithfulness as your faithfulness. But yet I know there's a lot of folks out there that do. I know there's a lot of folks out there that claim Faith by proxy. Because you're saying, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm this way because mom and daddy were. Listen. Now you may say, well, I'm not that way. Okay. Well, what about the Catholics? What about you folks that baptize infants? What is infant baptism if that's not faith by proxy? What is that? What is infant baptism if it's not faith by proxy? The parent is saying, I have faith, and so I'm going to have my child have some water dribbled on their head. I'm going to have the priest get his, dip his thumb on there and wipe the kid's head. Pour some water over his head. What is that if that's not faith by proxy? You are saying you have faith, and therefore, you're going to submit your child this way. I believe the, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but the Methodist discipline actually says that the, the parent is supposed to bring the child. The guardians bring the children. What, what is that? Isn't that faith by proxy? Isn't that faith by proxy? So the parents have the faith for a baby or for a child that cannot believe on his own that cannot repent on his own because he doesn't have any sin, and yet you're going to bring them. Is that not faith by proxy? See what we're talking about, friends? You may be laughing. You may be laughing at the Latter-day Saints. You may be laughing at the, at the Mormons for all this baptizing people for the dead, 
baptizing people who have already been dead and dead long gone, but you have just as many proxy religions as they do. You've got sin by proxy. You've got faith by proxy. Someone else is going to do it for you. Let me tell you, man-made doctrines, man-made doctrines are just lazy. Man-made doctrines just make lazy people. Baptism by proxy, for someone who was too lazy or didn't know that they should be saved, well, we're going to be baptized for you. Then you got Adam coming along sinning by proxy. Now you got people who have, who have faith by proxy. They're going to put that on their children. And notice this. Now you have worship by proxy. Worship by proxy. You say, James, what do you mean worship by proxy? Listen, I, there's a lot of people that think that they can let other people worship for them and they'll be fine. Listen to what the Bible says. Listen to what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20. Paul says, When ye come together, therefore, into one place, When you come together one, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now he's criticizing them, chastising them, because they are abusing the Lord's Supper. They should have been coming together to partake of the Lord's Supper, Acts 20 and verse, 20, Acts 20 and verse 7. But they came together into one place. Now friends, there's a lot of individuals, I'm, I'm telling you, there's a lot of individuals that want to worship by proxy. They don't want to assemble together. Listen to what they say. Listen to what this caller says. Yeah, I was wondering why, why do you want to go to church if you got a Bible? I'm sorry? Why would you want to go to church if you got your Bible? Because the Bible tells me about a church. Mm, that's true, but I mean you can get everything at church through your Bible. Well, but the Bible says, also says that you have to assemble with the other members on certain occasions for certain purposes. And well, can you like, get for, your family together and read the Bible? Well, you can. And then, wouldn't that be like the same thing as going to church? Well, not, not exactly, because God says to assemble with the saints. See? Assemble with the saints, uh, Hebrews 10 and verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of your saints... Uh, assembling yourselves together as is the manner of some. So you, you have to come together on the first day of the week with the other members of the body of Christ. All right, now, friends, you hear that? The man says, well, what if, why can't I just, uh, why do I have to go to church if I've, got, if I've got a Bible? Friends, it doesn't work that way. That's not what God wants. God didn't say for you to. All right, then, well, thank you. All right, good call. Thank you for your call. All right. Now, here's my question. My question is, why is it that people don't want to assemble together? Why is it they don't want to come together? They're going to let everybody else do it. But isn't it the case that they're basically phoning it in or they're letting someone else do it? Let's, let's look again. Let's look at this. Let's look at the Bible. Let's go back to what the Bible is saying. In 1 Corinthians... Chapter 14 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 19. Paul says, <clears throat> Yet in the church I had rather speak the words with, my, with understanding. I'd rather speak five words with understanding that by my voice... I might, I'm having a hard time reading that. That my, that my, my voice, I might uh, teach others. Re, uh, well, I'm, I'm having a hard time reading that, uh, the glare. I'm, I'm going to just pull over here. That I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, 
but in understanding be men. So Paul says, I would rather speak where people can understand me so that they may be edified. Now notice this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 23, if therefore the whole church be come together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? Now they're supposed to be edified. They're supposed to be uh, edified, but notice, they're coming together in one place. They're coming together in one place. Let's look again at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together? Wait, they're coming together for what purpose? They're coming together for worship. And you say, well, I've got a Bible. Therefore, I, I, I'm, I'm okay. Friends, that's not God's plan. God's plan is for his people, for the saints, to come together in one place for the purpose of being exhorted and edified. Hebrews 10 and verse 26, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. There's a point and a purpose that God wants us to assemble together so that we can be provoked to good works. Look at this. Let us consider one another to provoke uh, to provoke unto love and to good works. Now friends, how can you be provoked to good works? How can you be encouraged? How can you be edified and uplifted just by staying at home and saying, well, I have my Bible? My friends, there's no doubt about it. Reading your Bible is essential. You should be reading your Bible at home. But when people say the church is not important, the next thing they do is they say, well, the worship's not important when you come together in the church. And so I guess they're, in a sense, they're by proxy, by proxy they're, you know, letting their uh, uh, worship be done by someone else. I know a lady called in one time and told me that she worshiped in the green recliner. And that was, you know, that's always stuck with me. You worship him by proxy. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to assemble. I'm going to let everybody else do it. Friends, the Bible clearly commands on the first day of the week. That is what, that's the example that we have. That's the command that we have. That's when acts of worship are to be done on the first day of the week. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, read to Paul and Lamar, and he continued speeches till midnight. It's on the first day of the week. On the first day of the week, they were commanded to lay by in store as God has prospered them. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order, there's a command to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that the, prospered him that there be no gathers when I come. Now, friends, how are you gonna how are you gonna do this? How are you gonna obey these commands? How are you gonna obey the command to commune with the Lord on the first day of the week with the Lord's Supper in the Lord's Supper if you're not assembling? You gonna do that by proxy too? How are you gonna how are you gonna keep the command to lay by and store as God is profiting? Not not tithing, not giving a ten percent, but as you've been prospered, as you purpose in your heart. How do you do that? How do you lay by and store? If you do it, if you're supposed to do it when you come together, but you're not coming together. But see, this is what happens when you get away from the Bible. Then people start doing their own thing. It's just like they come up, they start coming up with all these strange doctrines and strange ideas of what is, is acceptable to God. And just as crazy and, and wacky as it sounds for the Latter-day Saints to be over baptizing someone who's been dead a hundred years, it's just as crazy for you to say, well, I believe in sin by proxy and faith by proxy. I believe in, <clears throat> I, I believe in, uh, uh, Worship by proxy. 
You're going to let everybody do everything else for you. Friends, that's not, that's not what God had in mind. That's not what God planned. God intends for individuals to give an account for themselves. Because I'll submit to you, the, I'll ask you to consider this. One more thing. What are you going to do about judgment by proxy? Are you, going to, are you going to stand on judgment for someone else? I mean, you laugh at the Mormons. You ridicule them for baptizing someone for the dead, baptism by proxy. But you don't think it's, you don't think it's so funny to believe in sin by proxy or faith by proxy, salvation by proxy, right? Worship by proxy. Well, what about judgment by proxy? Is that, is that something you're willing to embrace? Are you willing to be judged by proxy? Now, let me tell you, if you've been disobeying God, you're going to hope someone's going to stand in for you. But that's not the case. Everybody is going to stand for themselves. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Friend, you may think you can phone in your faith about you someone else. You can phone in your sin. Let Adam sin for you. You can let your mom and your daddy have faith for you. You didn't even go to your mom and daddy's church. You can say, well, I'm going to worship by proxy. I'm just going to stay here at home. And you can sit there and laugh at the Mormons for, being bapti for baptizing people by proxy. But there's one thing that you're not going to be able to do by proxy. And that's stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There's no way, no way, no shape, no how. Are you going to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to phone that in. Because let me tell you, there's nobody that will want to stand for you in your place on that day. Because everybody, everybody is going to be judged. Colossians, this is Colossians 3 and verse 20, 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respecter of person. You know, you can get someone to go to jury duty for you. You can get someone to stand in for you and Maybe vote or something. I don't know. You can get someone to take your place doing a lot of things. But you don't have a choice on this. My friend, do you really want, do you really want to prepare for eternity? A day that you cannot escape. An appointment that you cannot escape. Paul said uh, there's a point a man wants to die and after that the judgment. So, no one is going to be able to stand on judgment for you. So why don't you do something for yourself? Here's what you can do for yourself. The Bible says that whosoever, whosoever will, those individuals who have a determination to obey God, they can have their sins forgiven and not worry about having to stand before the judgment seat of Christ on that day. 
John 3, 16, verse everybody knows, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever, that whosoever is whoever will be obedient to his will. What do you have to do? <clears throat> if you hear the gospel, that produces faith, the word of faith which we preach. Paul said in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So when you hear the word of God, it produces faith. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then why don't you repent of your sins? Repent of your sins. Paul said God commands all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17 and verse 30. Now, if you're repenting, you're turning from a life of sin to a life of serving God. One of the acts of repentance that you'll do is you will confess Jesus Christ the Son of God. You'll make that confession. I believe Jesus Christ the Son of God, just like the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, verse 36, 37. Making the statement that you believe Jesus Christ the Son of God puts you a step closer to your sins being forgiven. On the day of Pentecost, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And remember, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. It's not, some, not something done by proxy. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you're determined that you're going to do it, then do it. But no one can do it for you. I was talking to a, uh, a fellow just the other day, and I said, you know what? I want you to obey the gospel. I can't do it for you. I can't do it for you, but I can sure help you. Friend, if you want to obey the gospel, if it's your desire and your will and your determination that you're going to do what God says in order to be saved, in order to prepare for the day of judgment that we're all going to, all going to attend, if I can help you, I, I sure want to do that. If I can assist you, that's what I want to do. I want you to know that your friends in the Church of Christ will help you prepare for the Day of Judgment because no proxies on the Day of Judgment. If we can help you, you can email me at wordfromthelord at gmail.com or you can call me at 276-340-2653. Till next time, friends, let us know if we can help you. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.